All right, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Our text for today is Ezra chapter 1. We focused on this last Lord's Day, so this is going to be a part two of sorts on Ezra chapter 1. I'll read our text in its entirety. When I finish reading the text, I'll say, this is the word of the Lord, at which point I would appreciate very much if you would respond by saying, thanks be to God. One final time, our text for today is Ezra chapter 1. The Bible says this, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is with uh, he is the God who is in Jerusalem, and let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beast, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, every one whose spirit God had stirred up to go up to re rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares, besides all that was freely offered." Cyrus, the king, also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. Cyrus, king of Persia, brought these out in the charge of Meredith, the treasurer, who counted them out to Shezbazar, the prince of Judah. And as was the number of them, thirty basins of gold, a thousand basins of silver, twenty-nine censers, thirty bowls of gold, four hundred and ten bowls of silver, and a thousand other vessels, all the vessels of gold and of silver were five thousand four hundred. All these did Shesbazar bring up when the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem. This is the word of the Lord. All right, please be seated. If you were with us last Lord's Day, I titled that particular sermon, uh, The Rise of Caesar and the Need for Christian Princes, uh, making that plural, not just one, but several Christian princes, thinking of the lesser magistrate, regardless of the system of government in a particular nation, uh, you're always going to have more than just one political ruler. You might have a supreme political ruler, uh, but there will be many that find themselves in that sphere of the civil magistrate, appointed by God uh, to the sphere of the state, civil authority, and we need not just one Christian, uh, but we need several Christians filling that role. So again, I titled last week's sermon, The Rise of Caesar, and I'm equating Caesar with Cyrus, who was a Persian king. And then I gave us a lot of the history. I gave us uh, the, the big 30,000 foot view history in terms of centuries leading up to Israel's exile and why they happened to be in captivity in the first place for 70 years in Babylon. But then I also gave uh, the microcosm of the history, not just for a millennia, approximately 800 years leading up to their captivity captivity, but then the, the history of those 70 years in captivity and how God prophesied through Jeremiah uh, the exact length of time that Israel would be held captive, how long they would be uh, exiles in Babylon and why they were exiles in Babylon and the time period and the things that would take place uh, when they eventually were delivered, liberated from captivity in Babylon. So we gave a lot of historical context uh, last week. And then we focus some attention on Cyrus. Uh, but today, what I want to do is shift the focus from Cyrus to the other characters that we find in the narrative, in this historical account, which come into play in verse 5. So let me read verse 5 for us uh, once more so that it's fresh in our minds. It says, Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild, rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. All right, so this is the first point that I want us to understand from the text today. The very same spirit of God 
That is God himself, the Holy Spirit, the very same Spirit of God that stirred up the heart of Cyrus, the Persian king who was over uh, Babylonia where the Israelites are being held captive at that time. The same Spirit of God that stirred up the highest civil ruler, namely Cyrus, is the same Spirit of God who also stirs up many hearts. Not just one heart at the top of the food chain but many hearts within the Israelite people themselves. And so this is kind of, I want to paint this picture. You have a foreigner, okay, that's Cyrus. He is not an Israelite. He's not a Jew. He's not among the people of God. He's a Persian king, and, and I don't have as much time to do the history that I did last week. Sometimes my problem is I will recap what I did before, and then the recap turns into the entire sermon that I did before, and then we can never move on. And then that's where a two-parter becomes a three-parter and a four-parter, and then you know a year goes by and we're still in Ezra 1. So I'll try not to do that. Pray for me, uh, because I, I need the grace of God. But uh, just a little bit of the historical context is Nebuchadnezzar was the Babylonian king who, uh, who conquered Jerusalem, conquered the Israelites when they initially were taken captive and went into this 70-year exile period. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar ruled for uh, the, the lion's share of that 70 years, 40-something years. Uh, then his uh, son or grandson, I can't remember. Uh, let me look back to the notes. It was uh, followed by his son. Okay, so Nebuchadnezzar, 45 years of that 70-year period. So it was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, and he was the Babylonian king who, uh, it was the first year of his reign that he took over Israel. He took them captive, conquered them. And then his son, and he reigned for 45 of that 70 years. Then his son followed him for 23 years. Then you only have a few years left. Now, what happened at the end of the 23-year reign of his son? So now we're, we're getting close to 70 years. Well, uh, it's not just that his son lost power and another Babylonian rose to power. Um, no, Babylon, the, the whole thing, was conquered. So Babylon conquers Israel, and then Babylon gets conquered itself by uh, a tag team force of the Persians and the Medes. And you have Darius and Cyrus are the two kings of these two other nations that join forces to take over the Babylonians. And I focused really heavily on the sovereignty of God last week, if you were with us, saying that in the one instance, according to God's sovereign will, what he predestines, which includes not just good things, but suffering and even sin, God would predestine and ordain even suffering, bad things, even sin, uh, for his good and holy purposes. God predestinating sin just for the record, does not make him the author of sin. It does not make him uh, culpable, uh, morally culpable for sin. But what it means is that God can ordain even bad things for good and holy purposes. And that is God's right, just for the record, and not ours. We don't get to play God. And when I say play God in this instance, to make that real specific, what I mean is um, that the, the arrogant mentality of man that would say that a good, good ends justify unlawful, wicked means. Right? Have you ever heard that expression? The end justifies the means. So we can do something uh, in terms of the means, the path to get to a certain uh, conclusion that we know are objectively wicked. It's objectively wrong. But we can do it if we're confident or if we even think that the outcome will be positive. Right? If you're ever wondering, you know, in, in our current political system, how politicians think, it's that. <laughs> I mean, that, that's pretty much the common denominator across the board when it comes to our civil rulers in this particular generation at this time in the West. They think they're God. That's, that's pretty much it. They think they're God. So they think they can do whatever they want and the means can be atrocious so long as they, uh, and they, and here's the problem, they don't even know that the end will be good. So number one, a good end wouldn't justify evil means and they can't even guarantee a good end. And yet they still think that they're justified in using wicked means. So man, when man does that, it's playing God, it's arrogance, it's sin, it's disobedience. Because our job um, is not to get together in a think tank session with, with the, all the experts and, and assert arrogant uh, degrees of confidence to say, we know the outcome will be this, and therefore we can do whatever we need to do in, in order to get to the outcome. No, that's, that's what God, God has that prerogative. We do not. As, as man, our job is to stick to the script. And as Christians, namely the scripture, that, that is our job is 
obedience, right? God desires obedience more than sacrifice, is what Samuel says to King Saul when he's playing God, uh, directly disobeying in the means, uh, thinking that that will somehow produce a righteous end. And so all that being said, uh, God in his sovereign will, which does include ordaining even uh, unrighteous acts to bring about good and holy purposes, in that sense, God predestines that, that uh, Israel would be in captivity for 70 years and predestines that King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, would be the king to accomplish his feat, that he would be the one who would go in and subdue Israel and take them as exiles uh, in Babylon. And yet Nebuchadnezzar, so God ordains it in the one sense to fulfill his sovereign will, what he had prophesied previously through Isaiah and Jeremiah, that Israel would be punished for 70 years because of their faithlessness. And yet in the other sense, Nebuchadnezzar is not absolved just because he's being used as a pawn in God's sovereign will and the big strategy that God has at play doesn't absolve Nebuchadnezzar at the individual level for his own sin. And one of the sins, there are many, but one of the sins that Nebuchadnezzar commits that we see this, this is explicitly said elsewhere in the scripture is that he didn't let Israel go. So on the one hand, God wouldn't let him let Israel go because Israel is supposed to be in captivity for 70 years because Israel's own disobedience to God. And yet on the other hand, on the other hand, Nebuchadnezzar was still being um, hard-hearted towards the spirit of God and, and lacking in compassion towards uh, the Israelite people and choosing not to let them go. And I talked about, you know, the, the, the verse that we're probably all familiar with. It says that the heart of a king is like a river and God guides the waters in whichever direction uh, he desires. And so we see God is using Nebuchadnezzar in a particular way, towards a particular end, namely the chastising and discipline with his fatherly rod of his people Israel. But then Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he dies, his son takes over, and then towards the very end of these 70 years, God in his sovereignty and in his faithfulness causes Darius and Cyrus, two kings, to join forces to conquer Babylon, even though God just got done using Babylon to do what he prophesied, predicted through Isaiah and Jeremiah, that to punish Israel, discipline Israel for their own sins, 70 years of captivity, and, and the rod that God uses, what I'm saying, the rod that God uses to discipline Israel, his sons, is Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. And then once God gets done disciplining Israel with the rod of Babylon, he then punishes the rod. It's the same thing that God did with Egypt, right? That Pharaoh, on the one hand, Romans chapter 9 talks about this, the apostle Paul. He says, on the one hand, God supernaturally hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Do you know why? Well, one, because of Israel's sin, they were being disciplined. In this case, for 400 years in captivity as slaves in Egypt. But on the other hand, one of the reasons God supernaturally hardened the heart of Pharaoh is because God wanted to display to his people his immense power. And if you're God, you're the infinite creator of the universe, and you want to show your power against one of your enemies, do you know what you have to do? Because you are so infinitely superior to your enemies, you have to use at least a portion of your power to supernaturally uphold your own enemy so that you can show, you know, your right hook. Because, because you won't get to show your people, show off and show your power with your, your three punch combo against any of your enemies because none of them will be able to withstand one punch, much, much less three. So what God is doing with Pharaoh in the case of Egypt is he's supernaturally hardening the heart of Pharaoh and sustaining Pharaoh because otherwise you and I would be reading the one plague of Egypt. The only reason we have 10 of them is because God with one hand is holding up Pharaoh and with the other is waylaying. And all of that just so that you and I thousands of years later can say our God is the God who can part the sea. Well, there would be no parting of the sea if God didn't supernaturally hold up Pharaoh. Because apart from God supernaturally hardening his heart, you know what you do after 10 plagues? You quit. You give up. Right? So this is the sovereignty of God. I talked about the two wills of God, his moral revealed will, what he says in scripture, the script that you and I are called to stick to, and then his hidden will, will namely his sovereign will, that includes him predestinating and ordaining bad things like the death of his son, 
or bad things like Pharaoh's hardened heart, or bad things like Nebuchadnezzar's hardened heart, not letting Israel go out of captivity. And God ordains these things which are bad, but he does it for good, wise, and holy purposes, for the, the glory of himself and the eternal good of his people. God can do that. We cannot. We don't get to play God. We don't get to say bad means but justified by a good end. Only God reserves to himself that right, and he does so without being the author of sin or the source of sin or the cause of sin. God is absolved and righteous and holy and good, and yet he ordains all things. So that was kind of the big picture from last week. And then in uh, this tag team duo force of the Persians and the Medes, Darius and Cyrus, taking over Babylon. So now Babylon used as a rod to punish Israel or to discipline Israel as sons for 70 years. And now the rod is being punished by God, uh, the Babylon itself. And God is using the punishment of Babylon. He's using as his tool. He's using Cyrus and Darius, the Persians and the Medes. And then Darius is older. And so he goes ahead and says, you know what? Instead of doing the duo tag team, rulership over Babylon. I'm retiring. And he gives it all to Cyrus. Now Cyrus becomes the singular leader over this whole Babylonian empire. And Cyrus in his first year of reign, in the same way that Nebuchadnezzar, his first year, he takes Israel captive, the people of God. And in Cyrus's first year, he lets Israel go. He liberates. So Nebuchadnezzar, he takes the people of God captive, which is what God planned, but also on Nebuchadnezzar's part, wicked. And then Cyrus, though, he does also the God's sovereign will, what God plans, namely not the captivity of Israel in his first year, but the liberation of Israel in his first year. And that was according to God's sovereign will, because all things are, but also according to God's moral will in the sense that he is exercising compassion and doing good to the people of God for the sake of God. He's doing good to the people of God for the sake of God. That's Cyrus. Now, Here's the point as it pertains to our text today and our focus for today. Cyrus is not enough. Cyrus is not enough. And for those of you who are privy to some of these conversations, it depends, you know, well, it depends what you do with your time, right? Some of you is like, well, I've got a wife and kids and a job. Good for you. Keep that up. Uh, others of you are like, I've got a wife and a kid and, and, and a job, but I also like to devote, you know, 15 hours to conspiracies and, you know, and reading every article and listening to every podcast. Um, so long as you're not neglecting your wife and your kids and your job and those things and praise God, all power to you. Uh, but Here's the deal. Some of you who are, you know, in some of these chat rooms and these podcasts and watching this and watching that, you might be aware that um, a lot of people over the last, you know, few years or so, especially 2015, 2016, they were likening Donald Trump to a Cyrus type. And I think that that was actually a good comparison. Uh, and what they were saying essentially was uh, that the Christian can have a clear conscience in voting for Donald Trump. Uh, and that vote, casting your vote, is not um, it's not an endorsement that, uh, that he has perfect character or even that he himself is regenerate. So it's not even making the claim that, that he's a Christian, but it's simply saying he's clearly the lesser of two evils. And I think this would have been the case in the 2016 election and the 2020 election. Um, but they're saying, and, and I think that he may not be a Christian himself, but he is serving as a Cyrus type, meaning uh, that he is uh, not necessarily... Um, a lover of the triune God, Yahweh himself individually, but he is positioned in God's sovereignty to do good to the people of God for the sake of God. He is um, a benevolent force towards God's people, towards Christians. And I think that that was a pretty good comparison to say, all right, so Trump is, uh, it's, it's probably not a, go a good uh, analogy or comparison to say Trump is like King Josiah in Israel who loved the Lord with all his heart. Or Trump is like King David right? Or Trump is like Jesus, right? There's been some of those comparisons and that's blasphemous. Please don't do that. Um, he's not. Uh, but, you know, but to say Trump is like Cyrus. He's a foreigner in the sense, not that he's a foreigner, that he's not an American citizen. I'm not saying in that sense, but a foreigner in the spiritual sense that very likely he is not actually among God's people. Very likely he's not a Christian. But like Cyrus, who was not among God's people, not a Jew, he still did much good for the Jews, so I think that's fair. The point, though, from our text today, again, the big point that we're going to focus on now is Cyrus is not enough. And to make it applicable and relevant for us today in the political realm, Trump is not enough. 
He would have my vote, absolutely. If he becomes, you know, the, the primary candidate, then yes, I will vote for Trump and I won't lose sleep over it. And I know that some Christians would disagree with that and say that's wrong. Um, that's politics. And I'm not saying that it's great, um, but yes, I will absolutely vote for the lesser of two evils in a two-party system. And that's what we have right now. So there you go. Um, all that said, that doesn't mean that he'd be an elder in our church or even a member in our church. I'm not validating his character in every regard or this or that. Uh, but in my lifetime, uh, he's the best president that we've ever had. Um, and plenty of flaws. Uh, it's a low bar when you say the best president in you know, the last 37 years. I mean, it's a really low bar. I think if we could elect you know, a, a packet of pudding, that would probably be, you know, probably, you know, be the, the new best president you know, in our lifetimes. But all that being said, the point is this. Um, he'll have my vote if it goes that direction and that's what plays out. Um, but I, if I had to bet, you know, God, man looks at the outward appearance, God alone sees the heart, so I'm not making a definitive statement here about Trump's salvation. I don't know. But, but Jesus does say, right, so God definitively sees the inward man. We look to the outward man. But the Bible does say that you can know someone's heart by looking at their external fruit, right? And, and there's enough things from Trump in terms of policies and things like that, there's been some really great things, but there's enough stuff in his rhetoric. And I'm not talking about being mean. I'm not talking about being mean. I mean, David called down curses on his enemies, so I'm fine with that. Um, I, I, I got biblical arguments for, for a lot of the rhetoric, not all, but a lot of the rhetoric. But I'm talking about statements that say, you know, like, hey, have you ever repented for anything or regretted anything? It's like, no, nope, never repented for anything. Uh, instead, my strategy is just never to make a mistake, and I'm nailing it. That's, uh, that's a paraphrase, but that's pretty much a quote, you know. So that's like, that doesn't bode well for, you know, anyone who's trying to, uh, you know, adamantly, ardently defend, you know, the salvation um, of, of Donald Trump. And again, none of that is to say that he won't have my vote, all right? So all that being said, uh, my point is, I think Cyrus is the better comparison. Cyrus is a foreigner. He's not among the Jewish people. He's not among the people of God. Uh, Trump, in this New Testament era, in the, in a, uh, era, in the, in the uh, spiritual sense, I think, likewise, a foreigner. In the objective, internal sense, I don't think that he's a Christian. Um, but God can use foreigners, and Cyrus is a wonderful example of this. God can use, and we see it throughout the Old Testament and even the New, can use a foreigner for his glory and the good of his people. And so I'm all on board for that strategy. I, I say all that to say this. I'm on board for that strategy. That's been in the rhetoric, you know, of some of the podcasts and some of the articles and the books that have been written, you know, and all this kind of stuff for the last seven years. And I think it's fair. I, I'm on board. Um, but Cyrus is not enough. Likewise, as it pertains to us, if you're saying Trump is the new Cyrus, you know, Trump is not enough. Look at the text one more time, namely verse 5. Then rose up, right? not just Cyrus. So God sovereignly, supernaturally causes Darius and Cyrus to conquer the Babylonians. Darius retires. Cyrus takes full charge, singular leader, the, the, the highest leader in the land in his first year of reign, He's going to let the people of God go. He's doing immense good, and he's going to resource them with gold and silver. That's amazing. That's amazing. And yet even that is in, insufficient. It's not enough for God to do what he wants to do through his people in rebuilding the ruins. And that's the time that we're living in right now. If you're not aware, we are in ruins. We are in ruins. The West is in ruins. And if the people of God were to be successful, if this is God's will, that we rebuild the ruins, you need more than Cyrus. Verse 5. Then rose up, not just Cyrus, but the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit... Right? So it's just as supernatural, just as divine. It's not just their own idea, but God supernaturally stirs up the heart of uh, Cyrus, but then the same Spirit of God stirs in the hearts of the houses, the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the ruins, to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. Now, let's nail down a little bit deeper now, a little bit more specific. Who do these houses... Right? There's four things that are named in verse 5, uh, four, four categories, four groups. Who do they represent? I would argue that there's two primary groups. Uh, there's four names, but two primary groups. In the one sense, verse 5, it says, The father's houses, the heads of the father's houses of Judah and Benjamin, that's one group. 
So instead of getting overcomplicated and say there's four groups, there's Judah, there's Benjamin, there's uh, the priest and the Levites. Now the priest and the Levites, that's one group. The priesthood was given to Levi. That's is the Levitical priesthood. So you have the priest on one hand, Levites, priests, view that. And the, the, yes, there's some nuanced distinctions, but, but it, for our purposes today, in sim, simple terms, think priest. Okay, and then Judah, where this is Jacob prophesying right before he dies as he's on his deathbed with his sons, giving out blessings, which are really prophetic blessings of what God would do through each of his son's descendants. Uh, Jacob, inspired by God, this is God's doing through Jacob the patriarch, he gave the priesthood to Levi and he gave the scepter to Judah. He gave the scepter to Judah. And Jesus comes from the line of Levi, right? No. Well, Jesus, it's all, he just has a spiritual kingdom, right? So he comes through the priest line, right? No, he comes through Judah, the king line, the scepter line. That's significant, not a priest, that, you know, but we, we don't have time for that. Plus, I've given that sermon like 40 times. So you guys, you're probably good. So here's the point, though. Benjamin and Judah, I think what's significant there is it's the father's Okay, it's not the mothers, it's not the matriarch, it's not, you know, uh, smash the patriarchy, it's none of that, right? It's not slay queen, boss girl, it's n none of that. So it's the, the fathers, right? This is the real world, re real life, you know, not, not post-enlightenment, you know, um, just absolute confusion and foolishness. This is real. It's the fathers of houses, namely within two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. What's being signified here, if we were to sum it up, again, trying to make this as simple as possible, into one word, I would say, it's, it's one phrase, the civil leaders. It's the politicians. And I know, you know, that, that word, because all we've known is bad politicians. So, but think in the, in the most positive way you could possibly think of a po politician, which I know I, I understand that's a difficult exercise. But in the most positive light that you can imagine, you have the civil leaders, a.k.a. politicians. Over here, the Levites and the priesthood think, priest. And so two groups in two words, politicians and pastors. When God wants to rebuild the ruins that were caused in the first place because of compromise and rebellion and disobedience, a Cyrus is not enough he stirs up the heart of a chief leader who may even be in a, a foreigner outside of the people of God, like Cyrus or like Trump, but he also simultaneously, because he knows that's insufficient, within his own people, not just the supreme leader who is a foreigner, but also within his people, there are lesser magistrates, and he stirs up two types of leaders, spiritual leaders, the pastors, and the, the civil leaders, the politicians. Christian politicians, or a.k.a. Christian princes, plural, and Christian pastors. So it, it, last week, the title of the sermon was The Rise of Caesar and the Need for Christian Princes. This week, if I were to title it, I would say it's uh, Caesar is Not Enough, the Need for Christian polit uh, Princes, Politicians, Christian Princes, and Christian Pastors. One of the reasons that we're still in the mess that we're in today, and one of the ways you can know that we're desperately in need of revival, that yes, some people are waking up. I'm grateful for the mercy that God has given us. It's not as though there's no signs of blessing or no signs of mercy. But one of the reasons you know that, that we're, not we're not yet at the point where we can say, we're right on the cusp of revival and everything's about to change. And I'm not trying to discourage or despair anyone. We trust in, in God in good times and in bad. Okay? But one of the reasons I know that, that there's still some more work to be done on the part of God in terms of supernaturally stirring up hearts is because in 2020, sure, a bunch of people, you know, took the red pill, their eyes were open, you know, the veil is lifted and they see the corruption, they see this and they see that. And we need to turn back to God. Uh, but you know who didn't lead the way? Politicians and pastors. They didn't. But when God is ready to send real restoration, real revital, revitalization, real revival, and real genuine rebuilding of the ruins of a prior Christendom, the city of God, when God really wants to rebuild his city, when Christendom is really truly about to be restored, or at least the building project is about to be begun, God doesn't just stir up the hearts of the people, but he leads the people by stirring up the hearts of leaders. 
among the people, and, and specifically two kinds of leaders, the spiritual leaders, the priests, the pastors, and the political leaders, the princes. So there may be a Cyrus, a foreigner, who is elevated in a sudden fashion, someone that you never thought would take power, right? We're underneath Babylonian power. Boom, Persians and Medes, overnight. Nobody saw it coming, except for a couple prophets, but nobody saw that coming. And then all of a sudden, it's like ba Babylon is wicked. Babylon will never release us. We're in captivity. We're slaves to the regime. Right? And then all of a sudden, boom, you're taken over by a foreign power. And the foreign power that you think would probably even be worse than Babylon, God stirs in the heart of the supreme leader within that foreign power to where all of a sudden, even though he himself likely is not a follower of God, he wants to do good to the people of God. And it's all glory to God. It's just it's just God drawing straight lines with crooked sticks. It's just God showing off his immense, incredible, mysterious, sovereign power. And even that, as incredible as that is, is insufficient. Cyrus is not enough. You also need Christian princes among the people of God, not foreigners, meaning within the house of God, there are Christians in lesser magistrate positions of civil power. Judah, Benjamin, heads of houses, the political leaders, the Christian princes. And you need the Levites and the priests. You need the pastors. And in 2020, if there was any sign that told us we still got a long way to go, we're not going to get revival tomorrow, the sign should have been this, that the Christian politicians and the Christian pastors folded like a cheap suit. They didn't do a thing. And say, so, well, what about, yeah, uh -huh, three of them, maybe. Sure. And praise God for those three. But by and large, by and large, I mean, this, and, and I say this as an indictment. This is not an endorsement of, of the company I'm about to name. But uh, far more credit against the whole LGBT madness, far more credit to our shame is due to Matt Walsh than it is to any evangelical pastor. That's, and again, that's, that's not a compliment. I am grateful for Matt Walsh. I'm not trying to put him, but I'm just saying, the people of God should, should be lapping the daily wire in faithfulness. That's sad. So if there was any sign that, okay, rebuilding the ruins is probably still a little ways out. It's probably not gonna happen in the next 15 minutes. It was the fact that maybe we did get a Cyrus. But you know why Trump was not enough? You might have had the Cyrus, but you didn't have the Christian princes and the Christian pastors. You didn't. They were all compromised. They were all bought and paid for. Russell Moore, bought and paid for. Tim Keller was bought and paid for. Francis Collins, bought and paid for. David French, bought and paid for. And the receipts are coming out. These aren't just, you know, bold statements, hyperbolic. No, I mean, the, the, the literal receipts of proof of meeting together, having a name of their group as early as 2015 and even before, calling themselves the outliers and meeting multiple times in person with, with uh, premier writers in the New York Times and Keller and Russell Moore and Francis Collins and saying, we've got to do something because we've been drifting left as a nation under Obama for eight years, and that's great. We love it. Tim Keller loved to see the evangelical church become more progressive. He loved it. Whatever good he did earlier on in his ministry, I'm grateful for, but that guy did not finish well. It is an objective, definitive reality. He compromised. He did not finish well. And they got together and formed an in-group person, right? Yeah, I mean, we don't want to be over conspiratorial, but this is all documented, right? If there's any conspiracy or any coup that actually happened, it's leaders within journalism, the media, medicine, and the house of God, pastors, that met in person multiple times year after year, and their main object, uh, objective was keep Trump out of office. Because Obama, we would rather have another Obama-type leader and continue this trajectory that gave us a Burgerfell. We'd rather continue this trajectory 
that have mean tweets. And that is the, the literal strategy of our premier evangelical leaders over the last at least 10 years. Then you're not ready for revival. There's your sign. There's your sign. You don't have the Levites and the priests. You don't. And Cyrus is not enough. Imagine Cyrus coming to power. Think about it as it pertains to our text. He comes to power and he says, I'm going to let you go. Really? On vacation? No, no, no. No, no. It's, it's not just for fun. You're going to go back home. Well, home is in shambles. That's a lot of work. Yeah, but, but I'm going to let you go and rebuild your city, your heritage, your homeland. Right? Doesn't that appeal to you? The house of God, your history. I'm going to let you go, and I'm not going to send you off empty-handed. I'm going to resource you by, by charging people to be generous, and wherever the generosity lacks, I'll fill it out of my own coffers, on my own dime. Imagine if Israel, right, Judah and Benjamin, the political leaders of households, and the Levites and the priests, the pastors, the spiritual leaders, imagine if they went to the people of Israel and said, uh-uh. Yeah, Cyrus is being generous, and it's nice that he's going to let us go, but honestly, Babylon is probably better. The regime, yeah, there's some problems, and sure, it's a little progressive and compromised, but is there anything worse than, than conservatives? Is there anything worse than the right? Yeah, we acknowledge, you know, that there's a problem with abortion, and yeah, that's bad, and nobody here is pro-baby killing, but at the end of the day, I mean, to get Trump, you know, like, and that, that's, that's the difference. If you're wondering, what's the difference between Ezra chapter 1 and the last seven years here. That's the difference. Cyrus, Trump, pretty similar. Judah and Benjamin are Christian magistrates. Not quite as good. But that's not our biggest problem. Here's the biggest problem. Levites and priests in Ezra 1, evangelical leaders, Russell Moore and Tim Keller, whew, there's your disparity. There's the problem. Oh, I can pinpoint it. Now, that's how we're different. That's the problem. That's the weakness. The Word of God is incredibly relevant for all places and all times. All places and all times. All right, here's another point for the from the text that I want to make. Let me read, uh, I believe this is a quote. No, I'm just going to read uh, and then I'll give you a Matthew Henry quote. King Cyrus was illuminated. This is the bottom of uh, the front page. King Cyrus, and dealing with verse 5 primarily, King Cyrus was illuminated with knowledge about Jehovah, recognizing him as the only living and true God who is the supreme ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. Even though he hadn't learned about God through upbringing, right? He was raised as a foreigner. He wasn't, he's not an Israelite. He wasn't raised in the house of Israel, trained by priests. He, he did not grow up knowing Yahweh. So he hadn't learned about God through upbringing. And yet in his current state, God somehow made him aware enough now, we don't know. Maybe Cyrus was saved, actually born again. But that's not clear. But God made him at least aware enough in order to perform this service to God by blessing the people of God. Cyrus openly declares that he's doing it. Firstly, to express gratitude to God. Not necessarily trust in Yahweh for salvation, but expressing gratitude. He, number one, God stirs him up and illuminates him to the degree that he at least realizes that the Hebrew God, the triune God, Yahweh, is the God that is above all other gods. That he is the God of heaven, not only earth or certain sub-regions of the earth, but he is the God of both heaven and earth, God above all other gods, king above all other kings. So first, in the first instance, God illuminates his heart and his mind enough to to recognize the existence of God. Secondly, to fill his heart with a sense of gratitude to God. Gratitude for salvation, regeneration, born it. No, not necessarily. But at least what we know that's explicit from the text is that he fills his heart to recognize that God is real, God exists, and to have gratitude towards God for the power, the civil power and authority that God gave to him. So what does Cyrus know about God? that we can tell that's clear in the text without speculation. Well, we know at minimum, he at least knew that the Hebrew God is the true God, that God exists, and that God is king over all the kingdoms of the earth. 
which means whoever God sets up as a human ruler over various kingdoms of the earth is someone that God actually instituted. Nobody has authority on earth unless God, who is sovereign over all earthly authorities, chooses to give it to them. And so Cyrus recognizes God exists and God made me king. And if nothing else, I'm grateful to God for making me king, and so I will give something back to him. The very thing that God stirred up my heart to give, namely the release of his people and resources so that they can be, uh, rebuild uh, his city and his temple. Okay, now the quote. Matthew Henry, Cyrus not only, this is the back page, very top, Cyrus not only gave his good wishes, all right, this pertains to us, not just a political application here. I'm going to focus now on a spiritual application. The house of God. Not just America as our civil nation, but the church. Cyrus not only gave his good wishes with those that went. Their God be with them, is what he says in verse 3. But he took care also to furnish them with such things as they needed. He took it for granted that those among them who were of ability would offer their free will offerings for the house of God to be rebuilt, to promote the rebuilding of it. But besides that, that is in addition to that, he would have them supplied even out of his own kingdom. Here's the last thing that Matthew Henry says. On verse 3 and 4 and 5 of our text, commentating, well-wishers to the temple should be well-doers for it. Now, as it pertains to us in this gospel age as New Testament Christians, do we have a temple? Biblically speaking, yes. But it is not a physical temple with physical stones. It is a spiritual temple built with living stones, and the living stones are each individual regenerate person of God's household. That's what Ephesians tells us, that we, like living stones, are being welded together, built together to make a living temple, a spiritual temple, the ultimate temple for the house of God. For God to dwell in. He inhabits God right now. When we gather as the people of God on the Lord's day, God dwells in our midst. That he, he actually uh, inhabits, the scripture says, the praises of his people. That he meets with us and communes with us. That we are coming together as living stones forming the true temple of the Lord in which he dwells. So there is, I'll, I'll just make this very, very plain. There is a third temple. It's the church of Jesus Christ, made up of, from among every tribe, tongue, and nation. No genetic lineage or line. It's the people of God from the Sudan and from China and from the U.S. of A., from whoever God saves. And it is a universal church. It stretches throughout all the ages of the Christian church. Constantine is a part of this. Augustine is a part of this. Athanasius is a part of this. Calvin is a part of this. Luther is a part of this. And you and I, insofar as you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and have been saved and born again by grace and grace alone, you are a part of this temple. You are a living stone. There was one temple, the one that Solomon built. A second temple, the one that's going to be rebuilt that we see in Ezra and Nehemiah. So that's temple number one, temple no number two. The third temple is you. There will be no literal, physical third temple that's built in Israel. Anyone who tries to accomplish this task will be absolutely decimated in the providence and power of God. God will not, I guarantee it, I make very few predictions. I'll make this one because it's in the Bible. God will not allow a third temple to be established in Israel because he's already been building a third temple for 2,000 years with his people who are saved in Christ. That's the third temple. That's it. So what does Cyrus do? Right Here's the second temple, and then I'll apply that to the third temple, which is spiritual, the church. In the literal sense, Cyrus, in the rebuilding of a second physical temple in Israel, Cyrus says, I'm going to charge the people of God to be team players, to be uh, participants, not spectators. Get involved, be diligent, be generous. And I'm not just going to command others to do what I am unwilling to do even myself. 
I will inspire them and urge them to their own participation, their own generosity in rebuilding this temple. But I too, wherever they lack, I will give and be generous and support the rebuilding of this temple. So you and I now, skipping forward as New Testament Christians in the gospel age, building not a physical but a spiritual temple as living stones, the third and final temple, how should we behave? I would argue simply this. At least equal, if not superior and even more so than the pagan Cyrus. If the pagan Cyrus was all about supporting and resourcing through generosity and through this and through that, the building of the second temple, then we as Christians who have been saved by the very blood of Jesus Christ should give our whole lives to resource, not just well-wishing, but well-doing. That's the point. Cyrus doesn't just say, God commanded me to let you go. I'm going to let you go, but I'm not going to give you anything. And I wish you well. Right? James talks about this. He says, be wary of the person who says he loves the house of faith. Not just his neighbor, but his brother in Christ. And says, hey, be warm and well-fed and clothed. But then does nothing to actually meet his tangible needs. He says, that kind of love isn't love. Faith without works is dead. So too... That applies to Cyrus. Cyrus doesn't just say, I'll let you go. I give you my permission. And not only my permission, but my well, happy wishes. No, he, he, he is not just a well wisher. He's a well doer. I give you cash. I give you gold. Be better than ca cash is nothing, uh, sadly. Um, you know, but I give you actual money, not fiat currency that's been, you know, completely de destroyed. Um, I give you resources and wealth. I'm not just a well-wisher, I'm a well-doer. If that's Cyrus, who very likely, as far as we can tell, again, he believes in the existence of God and even acknowledges God as sovereign above all other gods and the source of his own authority. But as far as we can tell from the text, there's nothing definitive to indicate that Cyrus ever became a Christian. So if that's a pagan foreigner king who was likely unregenerate, meaning Cyrus very possibly, I'm not saying definitively, but very possibly Cyrus currently today is in hell. And if Cyrus can put up those stats on the board in terms of being pro-house of God, then you and I as born-again Christians in the New Testament, having the completion of the canon, all four uh, narratives of the gospel, knowing what we know, having new hearts, having uh, our bodies actually temples of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, stirring us up constantly day in and day out towards love and good works, certainly we should do more, not less, than Cyrus. And Cyrus does not just to the temple rebuilding project give his well wishes, but he gives his well doing. So too we, with the third temple, in a spiritual sense, is the church, people are the stones, being built together, and we too should not just wish that the church would increase and grow, wish that the church would be united, stones coming together, but we should work, not just wish toward that end, but work toward that end. Our time, our talent, our treasure, Cyrus gave, we should give. Right, Cyrus did something. He worked. We should work. If a pagan king could resource the second physical temple, how much should we as Christians, New Testament Christians, resource the third and final temple, which is our own brothers and sisters in Christ? Living stones being built in the temple, into the temple of the Lord. All right, last thing. Um, among the house of Judah and the house of Benjamin, among that category of, of Christian princes, right? Levites and priests, there's your Christian pastors. Now, Judah and Benjamin, Christian princes. Here's one example, and this is the last thing that I want us to see from the text, because there's a character that appears that's significant we need to know, be aware of, as we move forward, okay? In verse 5, leaders, I'm reading now underneath, however, a Christian prince is not enough. In verse 5, leaders from the families of Judah and Benjamin took the initiative. The priests and Levites were also among the first to head back to Zion. When God inspired Cyrus to proclaim freedom, the same divine influence moved both the political and pastoral leaders among the people of Israel to seize the opportunity. We see that in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Despite tempting reasons to stay in Babylon, 
right? It's easier. There's nothing to rebuild. Sure, we're captives, but we've got food. There's familiarity. There's connections. And the challenging journey, if we go, is intimidating. Despite all that, some overcame these obstacles. Their spirits, uplifted by God, were fueled by a desire for freedom and a love for their homeland, a love for their heritage. In order to achieve the rebuilding of Israel's heritage, God not only stir stirred up the heart of a foreign king, Cyrus, but who was likely an unbeliever, but he also divinely inspired a native leader within Israel itself, one who had despised Babylon from his youth, namely one Zerubbabel, who was a believer. Now here's something um, that's key about Zerubbabel. So, right, so you're going to have Ezra. Ezra's a priest, right? That's the book of the Bible we're in right now, Ezra. So among the, the native priests, right, they're not, uh, this is not foreigners. Cyrus is a foreigner outside the people of God. That's king, highest position. So foreign king, Cyrus, likely an unbeliever, but very helpful because God guides the hearts of kings like waters, whether they're saved or not. In the uh, our team category, the, the, the people who are among the people of God, you got two subcategories, politicians, Christian princes, and then the, the priests, Christian pastors. Uh, the main character in the, the pastor category is Ezra. The main ca uh, person in the uh, prince, politician category is Zerubbabel. Okay? Now, speaking of Zerubbabel, Matthew Henry, he says this, Judah had its own prince, even in captivity. Sheshbazar, supposedly uh, to be the same with, is supposedly to be the same as Zerubbabel, that that was his Babylonian name that he was given, but that this is actually Zerubbabel, a Jew among the people of God, which signifies that this name Sheshbazar, the Babylonian name that's given to him, it signifies joy and tribulation. I'll come back to that. But among his own people, he went by the name Zerubbabel, which means a stranger in Babylon. And so he looked upon himself. That's how he viewed himself, as a stranger in Babylon, and he considered Jerusalem to be his home. When you're looking for Christian princes, one thing to look for is a guy who from his youth has always despised Babylon. And that Babylon... Right? This, the regime clown world, trash world, has always been, in his view, a strange place to which he has never felt comfortable, to which, even though he may have been raised in it from his youth, he's never become too familiar. He's always resisted. He's always had this sense of, this is not real. This is fake. This is not God's design. This is foreign. I am a stranger in a foreign land. My true home is Jerusalem. My true home is God's will, God's kingdom, Christendom. That's my true home. And this current landscape that I'm living in is fake. It's not real. It's trash world. It's clown world. It's Babylon. And I despise it. I hate it. I have not made my peace with captivity. Yes, I am a captive and I'm not stupid. So I'm not, I'm not going to take the bait. I'm not going to just get imprisoned for the rest of my life. I'm, I'm not going to, to do something foolish. I'm calculated. I'm patient. I'm wise. But I am a stranger. This is not my home. I despise the regime. I despise what wicked men have done to my own heritage. I despise what Christendom has become. I despise what, what foreign rulers, those outside of the people of God, unbelievers, have done to my home. And from my earliest days of youth, I, meaning I didn't just get red-pilled uh, last Thursday. No, since being a child, I have had an aversion towards Babylon. And yet I am patient and wise, not a fool, patiently living in captivity in Babylon until God in his sovereignty moves the pieces on the chessboard into the right positions like Osiris and then go. Look for that guy. See if you can find that guy. You want to find who will be pivotal? Who's going to be a pivotal leader? No, th this is the point. Zerubbabel was not an opportunist. Zerubbabel was not someone who says, oh, now that Cyrus is saying we can go, I'm on team, let's go and rebuild the ruins. But previously, the rest of my life, I was pro-Babylon. All about it. 
again, making this, connecting it to our, our time and our place, our context, in 2020 and for these last three years, one of the things that you'll probably notice and have noticed is both in the politician category and in the pastor category, and I'll stick with this one primarily, the Christian pastor category, what we've seen is this. All of a sudden, the left overplayed its hand. There was backlash because of that. Some people woke up, right? The frog was slowly boiling in the water, getting hot and hotter. And then the left got cocky and said, you know what? We don't have to turn the dial slowly anymore. The frog's basically cooked. We can go ahead and finish the job. And they turned it up the rest of the way. And a few frogs in the, the pot of water, say about half of the frogs, still had enough nerve endings. They were barely alive to where they felt the change in temperature and they jumped out. And that's not the pastors. That the frogs in this case are representing just the people. But then what the pastors did is once 50% of the frogs jumped out, the pastors said, that's enough to have a church. That's enough for book sales. That's enough for a conference. Right? Lick the finger, put it up. Right? This is how many of our evangelical pastors lead. Which way is the wind blowing? Oh, that direction. And so the people actually are the ones who woke up who said, I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to give in. I'm going to take a stand. They assemble themselves into a national parade. And then the pastor who's been leading them leftwards for the last seven years, all of a sudden runs out to the other side of the people who have changed direction and pretends as though this parade that he's been adamantly working against is something that he himself actually engineered. That's not Zerubbabel. That's the point I want to drive home. What we see in the text is that Zerubbabel, both in the way that the Babylonians viewed him and the way his own people viewed him, he had two names. In the Babylonian case, he's called Shesh Bazar, Bazar. And what does that mean? It means joy in tribulation. And as his own people called him, Zerubbabel, his God-given name, what does that mean? A stranger in Babylon. This is not someone who once the people of Israel decide we're going to go back and rebuild, then he says, oh, yeah, I hate Babylon too. I hate Clown World too. Whereas previously, until there was the momentum, until there was the opportunity, he was cushy in Babylon. No, no, no. This is someone who is known both by the Babylonians and by the Israelites as someone who from his youth never embraced Babylon. He always despised it. It was always a foreign place to him. He always had this inward affection, devotion, commitment to his heritage, to his home. Babylon could not teach Zerubbabel to hate his heritage. Babylon could not convince him that the Israelites were actually, actually spelled A-C, you know, uh, A-K-C-H, you know, blah, blah. No, they could not convince him. Actually, the Israelites have been uh, for centuries oppressors and, and they're bad and you should hate. No, no, no. Zerubbabel did not take that bait. Zerubbabel could not be talked into hating his own people, despising their history, despising their heritage. And there's a reason why Zerubbabel was one of the primary leaders among Israel when it finally, in the providence of God, the pieces on the board got placed in the right spots for the rebuilding project to begin. Zerubbabel was one of the chief leaders because, not because he woke up yesterday, but because he was awake the whole time. He was awake the whole time. He was ready to go. So that's one more thing. The last thing I'll leave you with to look for is when God is doing a work of revitalization, not only within the church, but within a nation, within society, within the culture at large, you need, in God's providence, some foreign leaders who you can't even explain it, but somehow supernaturally they want to do good to the people of God. You need a Cyrus. But Cyrus is not enough. You also need Christian princes, plural, not just one, but many of them that are regenerate, are Christians, and you need Christian pastors. And these need to be guys who are ready to lead the way, not sit there in their ivory tower, in their comfortable vocations, until enough of the people start going back towards the Lord. Then they lick their finger, put it in the wind, realize the direction things are headed, and then run in front of the people and say, hey, hey, I'm a Christian nationalist. 
Al Mohler. All right, just get real specific there. Al Mohler has had woke CRT books and professors in his seminary for years. And then enough people start to push back when their eyes are finally open because the left gets cocky and turns up the temperature too quickly all at once. Enough Christians say, this is it. We're done with that. They start coming this way. And then all of a sudden, Al Mohler starts talking about, yeah, Christian nationalism. Hmm, I'm on board. That's an opportunist. That's an opportunist. But neither, brothers and sisters, can we afford an ideologue. And if I'm to speak pastorally to our church right now, not just you know, somebody out there you know, who's, that I'm not responsible for pastorally and accountability, but to you guys, because I know you guys, I speak with you guys, I'm not really worried about the inclination of you to be opportunist. I'm worried about the inclination of you to be ideologues. And what I mean by an ideologue is somebody who... Their heart is in the right place. They know the truth and they have a true fidelity and commitment to it. But they lack sense at times. And they're willing to say, we're going to do it right now because it's right. And it, it's not the moment. And you take the bait and you take an, a precious saint who loves the Lord, who is who's faithful but could have done so much more over the next 10 years, and they did it all in 10 days, but now they're on the ADL's watch list, <laughs> and their assets are frozen. It's like, you, you could have, there's, my point is, it's a razor's edge, and it requires discernment and wisdom in this time that we're living between the opportunist who doesn't really have faithfulness to the Lord, that just does, goes where the wind's blowing, and just is in it for themselves. You don't want to be that, and I don't think you are. But on the other side, you can fall on both edges, on both sides. On the other side, there's the ideologue who is committed, whose heart really belongs to the Lord, but, but is not nearly as useful for the kingdom as they could be over the long haul because they're too idealistic. That's not, you have to have categories. There must be a category. For some of us, we're so simplistic that, that the only category we have for waiting is compromise. And I want to encourage you, as one of your pastors, that there are other categories theologically besides just compromise. That you actually, that there is the Christian category of shrewdness. That that is a real category that you can actually be shrewd where, and someone will probably accuse you at times. Someone on your team, a fellow brother, a Christian, say, you're being compromised. You're being cowardly. And you say, no, I'm being shrewd. I'm Zerubbabel. Trash world has never been my home. I've despised it from my youth. And when God puts the pieces into play, I will be leading the way. But I have a wife and kids to feed, and I cannot afford to go to jail this afternoon. And I'm not going to be a fool. I'm not. There's got to be some ground in between opportunist and ideologue. And I believe that Zerubbabel was that ground. For, for his whole life, until this moment, with Cyrus letting them go, think about that. His whole life, he hated Babylon, but yet the implication, this isn't explicit, but it's absolutely the implication. He, although hating Babylon, he lived peaceably, peaceably enough in Babylon his whole life to where he wasn't, um, he wasn't punished. I mean, think about it. If, if Zerubbabel had pulled the trigger prematurely in his zeal for his homeland, his heritage for Jerusalem, then Zerubbabel, when Cyrus, when it finally happens, Zerubbabel wouldn't be leading them. Zerubbabel would have been dead. Nebuchadnezzar would have already hung him. Do you see? It matters. Let's pray. Father God, help us to be shrewd, as cunning as serpents, but as innocent as doves. Not opportunists, not men who are bought and paid for, not double agents playing both sides of the field, truly committed in zealous fervency for you and your kingdom and your people, the house of the Lord, this third temple, the church. And yet at the same time, help us to be wise, cunning, and shrewd. And Lord, I pray that you would raise up not just a Cyrus, 
but that you would raise up within Israel, new Israel, the Christian church, that you would raise up both um, Christian princes and Christian pastors, both political and spiritual leaders who despise trash world, despise clown world, who love our heritage, our Christian heritage, and are ready with, with courage and wisdom to lead your people, the church, back to green pastures and still waters. We pray it for Christ's sake. In Jesus' name, amen.